We return now to live oral arguments at the U.S. Appeals Court in the District of Columbia, where judges are hearing whether a federal district court judge must dismiss the perjury case against Michael Flynn, as recommended by the Justice Department. But you haven't even waited to see whether he would defer. Uh, but anyway, that's, that, that was helpful. So if there were no Rule 48, the government could just stop pursuing the case and send a letter to the court, and, and that would be done, in, in your view. That would be effective in ending, even though there was a plea that was accepted. I think so, because there'd no longer be any Article Three controversy between the parties, and there wouldn't be any authority beyond Rule 48 for the district court to, to keep it alive. And that seems to me at least as important, maybe more important on the criminal side, where you're not just talking about an adversarial contest between private parties, you're talking about an adversarial contest between a private citizen and a branch of government. And what the district court has never explained is how it could keep alive a controversy, uh, not over the executive's objection, which means that if the Rule 48 motion has to be granted at the end of the day, then the real question is, what is the purpose of allowing unnecessary proceedings to play themselves out? Well, and the only I, I answer think, is the court thinks I think that there are no harms to the executive. Yes, and I think it's I mean, this has been clarifying here because I think I, you know our court has seen there to be a role um, un, under Amadown, for example, on page 620, where uh, we refer to Rule 28A's requirement of judicial leave, which gives the court a role in dismissals, and there it's just following indictment, you know, in the exercise of its responsibility, the court will not be content with a mere conclusory statement by the prosecutor, require a statement of reasons, um, the role of guarding against abuse of prosecutorial discretion. So there's a, there's a discussion of the role of the court. And as I took Judge Tatel's questions of you to, to also um, focus on, it feels like the court's role is particularly robust where there is a plea that has been accepted, and Amadan specifically talks about the imposition of, of a sentence, which is a matter for discretion of the trial judge. And so to the extent that there is a balance between executive authority and judicial authority, the judicial authority becomes more prominent when there's a conviction of guilt, um, you know, none of which is to speak ultimately to the merits of this a day, but just to, as I said, to probe your position that there is right. no role on these facts. But even just Amazon, that the court. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay, but even Amadown at, at 622 says, well, well, sure, the executive's got to supply a reason. But it, the Judge Leventhal says, but the court can't deny the Rule 48 motion because its conception of the public interest differs from that of the prosecutor. I don't know how to square that up with footnote three of the rehearing petition, which makes clear that the district court is going to conduct an independent inquiry into whether, in its view, we've satisfied the public interest. So even if the court disagrees with what the panel did, I still think in sending it back to the district court, as I said earlier, it would be helpful to provide the district court some guidance on what I take to be the fairly limited role for the district mm -hmm. court in this, in this mm. context, because of course, the court was aware of Amidown in Fokker. It relied on the statements in Amidown that rejected judicial oversight, and it cited all of the intervening separation of powers cases from the Supreme Court. I mean, it's not a blank slate. You have Armstrong, BLE, Waite, Heckler v. Cheney. So I understand but that- None of which involved mandamus Thank you, Mr. Ross, I just like want to so, make sure we have a chance yeah. to get, get through the follow-up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get to this welcome. Right, and on page 622, just, just to circle back of Amadon, the requirement of judicial approval entitles the judge to obtain and evaluate the prosecutor's reasons, close quote. Thank you. Thank you. Judge Wilkins? Yes, one question. Um, why isn't it a proper interpretation of Rule 48A and, and Rule 48B in Judge Millett's hypothetical, if the district judge observes what he finds to be a bribe occur um, in in her courtroom and the decides that 
she does not want to be a party to it, why can't the judge deny the 48A motion? And yes, the judge can't force the government to continue with the prosecution, but then the defendant just moves to dismiss because of impermissible delay um, under 48B, and the judge grants that motion. Why isn't that an appropriate way for that to play out? So three quick points, uh, uh, Judge Wilkins. The first is that there's no mechanism in Rule 48, as your question recognizes, to force the executive to proceed, which I think is strong evidence that that's not the purpose of the rule. Second, there are other ways to expose and respond to the executive misconduct that you were talking about, legislative oversight, impeachment, elections, all the rest. And the third is, I just think you don't have, you may disagree with me on this hypothetical. I think it goes to whether you have the considered position of the parties. But even if you think that it's not the sort of thing that, that uh, or it is the sort of thing that Rule 48 ought to cover, it does highlight, I think, how far we are from that in this case. Even if you thought that maybe a crime committed in front of the district court by the prosecutor would be the sort of thing that would allow the, the, the court to probe the government's motives, all that underscores is how far we are away from a case like that. There's no Armstrong allegation here of unconstitutionality. There's no allegation of unlawful conduct of the kind that you're talking about. There's a question about whether there's been improper political influence, as the court appointed amicus has said. But that's not the sort of thing that the hypo gets at. That seems like clearly the sort of thing that should be taken care of through political channels. Nothing further. Thank you, Judge Rao. Um, no further questions, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, General Wall. We'll give you a bit of time for rebuttal as well. We'll now hear from Ms. Yeah. Wilkinson. Thank you, Chief Judge Srinivasan, and may it please the court. The extraordinary remedy of mandamus is unwarranted when a district judge has yet to decide a pending motion. By appointing an amicus, scheduling a hearing, and receiving legal briefing from the parties, the district court is doing what district courts do, preparing to rule on a motion. The judge has not asked any questions of the government or anyone else. No fact-finding has been requested, and briefing by the parties is not finished. Once that process is complete and the judge studies the papers, there may be little left to discuss at the hearing. The parties' speculation and fears about what the district court might do are not a proper basis for mandamus. Indeed, all agree that this court has never granted mandamus before giving a district court an opportunity to rule. The petition for mandamus should be denied for the simple reason that petitioner has adequate alternative means of relief. Three reasons support this common sense conclusion. First, the district court could very well grant the motion to dismiss, which is the outcome petitioner desires. Second, as the panel appeared to recognize, there's no irreparable harm to petitioner from permitting the district court to receive briefing and argument on a pending motion. Nor can the government, which did not petition for mandamus, show irreparable harm. The government's entire argument comes down to speculation about what might happen, but speculation cannot be the rationale for such an intrusive mandate from a reviewing court. Finally, for purposes of recusal, Judge Sullivan is not a party. Deciding whether to hear a case on bonk is solely within the power of this court. What we did as counsel was to suggest something this court can do on its own, and did. Our suggestion is consistent with the Supreme Court's definitive statement in Western Pacific, giving litigants and counsel the ability to request on bonk review, but the power remains with this court. Thank you, Your Honor, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Wilkinson, I have, uh, I have a couple of questions. First, in your view, is there anything that a district judge could do in advance of ruling on a motion in terms of setting out the grounds on which the district judge wants to hear further that would result in an entitlement to mandamus? I think it would be very difficult, Your Honor, in a vacuum to say he could do anything uh, because, as in this case, the judge has just ordered briefing and is determining what the issues are. Uh, but I could see the government objecting, for example, and I, there's no reason to believe this would ever happen, but if you're asking me a, a hypothetical, for example, if 
the attorney general was ordered to appear. I, I would think that would, would, would be something the government would object to, would move to quash, and the district court might easily say, you're right, I'm not going to do that. And that's the problem with all the arguments you've heard from the government. It's not only that they can say no when asked these questions that they fear are going to be asked, but the judge could accept their no, could accept their answer that this is privilege, this is part of the deliberative process, and move on. It's not clear that when they explain that, the court would continue. If we take out of play the harm that ensues from asking a particular official to appear, and we just stay within the kind of cases that involved the normal give and take between counsel for the government and the court, even in the scope of the hearing itself, you think there's nothing that the court could ask of counsel that would entitle the government to mandamus at that time. Your view is that even in the scope of the hearing itself, the government always has a remedy because it can decline to answer. And then um, if that occasions a ruling against the government, then that can be appealed? Yes. And, and then what do you do with, with uh, the acting solicitor general's explanation of Cheney, the, the proposition that, well, that was effectively what was at issue in Cheney, and the Supreme Court set down a different type of understanding in indicating that, no, it's not always enough that somebody can show up and decline to answer a particular question. Sometimes the mandamus is warranted even to keep a district court from going down that road. Cheney was different for two reasons. One, there was an actual order from the court ordering broad discovery and ordering the government to turn over the documents, and there the government did assert executive privilege before the case and gave the district court judge the chance to reconsider his ruling. So that, none of that has happened here. If there's any questions that the government thinks are improper, but, but again, they can... Not in Cheney, at least in some sense, was the... the the regime that the Supreme Court was reviewing was one in which the ostensible fail-safe was that the government could show up and decline to answer specific questions. The reason that's not relevant here, Your Honor, is the government has answered many questions already. The government hasn't taken that um, clear, specific, and, and full assertion of executive privilege. I think the government misspoke when they said that they shouldn't have to answer or they're not going to answer um, the 70-page uh, brief by the amicus during the dependency of these proceedings. They have filed a response in the lower court to the amicus brief, and they haven't asserted in that response any executive privilege, any deliberative process privilege, or that they can't turn over certain kinds of information. So they haven't, this, the facts of this case are not similar to Cheney. The government's had that opportunity, is, has responded, and has not claimed any privilege or any harm, any irreparable harm when they've actually answered the questions or responded to the motion or the pleadings. Okay, thank you, Ms. Wilkinson. Judge Henderson? No questions. Thank you. Judge Rogers? So your reading of Cheney is that absent the elements you just recited with the chief judge, that the court would not have, the Supreme Court would not have ruled that as it did. In other words, I thought some of the language in Cheney was very broad. I believe you're right, Judge Rogers, that the, the, the language was broad, but as it was applied, and, and uh, uh, it was because the government asserted the privilege generally, and the court said it should not have to go through each response or each discovery request and make those assertions because that itself on the specifics would reveal some executive privilege, and they shouldn't have to do that. And that was a very different case than here, where the government has chosen to respond and, and started with a a motion to dismiss that contained an application of uh, an explanation of the facts and the law. Yes, um, but you've heard the argument today as well as in the, the pleadings for the in-bank court in terms of um, the process and more or less the burden um, and the signaling, as it were, that the district court has given 
in terms of what it intends to pursue. Uh, and it's not framed in terms of trying to understand the government's uh, decision, although it could be framed that way if we apply the normal presumption that the district court will act in accordance with the law. So where you answered the chief judge by saying you couldn't see a situation where a process itself before the district court has ruled would give rise to uh, an appropriate issuance of mandamus. Um, you think that this, you think that the Supreme Court's application of Cheney is sufficiently limited? With regard to this case, I do, Your Honor, and perhaps I didn't make it clear that, of course, the court would follow the law, which starts with a very narrow scope of, of any argument or hearing uh, on a Rule 48A motion in these circumstances. So the government has, uh, I believe, misread or overinterpreted uh, the pleadings in this case where the legal issues are being raised. N nowhere has the trial judge said that he's going to collect evidence or require affidavits. He pointed out where some of these issues are. but. There's nothing that suggests he's going to do other, anything other than have a hearing where the lawyers argue the motion. There can be follow-up questions by him on the motion, and he'll decide the motion. There's that process, which occurs all the time in a district court, would not invade the separation of powers, would not usurp the power of, of uh, the executive branch, and there's no signaling to them that there are going to be these onerous or invasive questions. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Tatel. Um, Ms. Wilkinson, um, your argument, your argument is that mandamus is premature because the judge has simply scheduled a hearing and hasn't yet acted on the motion to dismiss. That's your argument. Yes, Your Honor. My question is this. Let's assume you're right that under Rule 48A, there is some substantive role for the district court. Does the judge actually have discretion to deny a Rule 48A motion? Is, is that included in his, can he deny it? Uh, in other words, if he, even if he has a substantial role, does that role include the discretion to deny the Rule 48 motion, because if it doesn't, then I don't understand what the purpose of the hearing is going to be. I think there's very limited discretion to turn or to deny that motion, but there is in the case law um, examples like the one, I believe, that uh, I don't remember who first started, but Judge Millett or Judge uh, Pillard used about bribery of the prosecutor, and in Fokker itself, the court recognized there's a presumption of regularity, but that could be overcome, and that could be a basis to deny the motion. Okay. We'll play that out for me, then. Let, let's assume you're right, that there is some discretion to deny the motion. Then what happens? In this case, it, it is different from when a prosecution is initiated. If it were denied, there's no role for the executive branch any further because sentencing is the only thing that's left. Now, the government and, and Mr. Flynn could take the position that they're going to mandamus after that. That's obviously uh, what I believe would, they think would be their next step. But if that didn't happen, the defendant would go on to sentencing, and then there would be an appeal, I assume, by, by either one or both of the parties. And how would that appeal come out? What would be the result of that? Well, if I'm reading the tea leaves properly, Your Honor, depending on who the panel is, um, this court appears to, and the Fokker decision suggests, that there's very limited discretion for a judge to turn down or deny that motion to dismiss. But there could be. I, I asked you a question that I did, which is if in the end, either because the district court reads Rule 48 as giving him no discretion, or if because this court later views Rule 48 as leaving the district court no discretion, 
what's the purpose of going through all of this? Well, well two, one, uh, Your Honor. First of all, that doesn't mean it's clear and indisputable now and that mandamus is appropriate now because you're talking about what would this court do. But the process itself of the judge participating in, with leave of court, which is receiving the briefing so he understands the scope of the government's motion and the law and then allowing lawyers to argue it and make a decision is not, even if the answer is predictable, is not an error and it's certainly not the basis for a mandamus for this reviewing court to come in and direct him to what you're suggesting in the hypothetical is inevitable. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you. Judge Garland? Yes. Um, so as I read what happened in the district court, all that the judge did was order um, responsive briefs and, and um, uh, uh, an oral argument to be held. But the panel decision focuses, uh, and, and the, your uh, opposing counsel, focus on what was done in the briefs. Um, in this court, and the panel says, before this court, the district court explains that he plans to question the bona fides of the government's motion, inquire about the government's motions and representations, illuminate the full circumstances surrounding the proposed dismissal, and probe whether the presumption of regularity for prosecutorial decisions is overcome in the unusual facts of this case. Is this different than what happened in the district court? Are you uh, forecasting what the district court plans to be doing? What is your answer to these statements in the panel's decision? We are not forecasting anything, Your Honor, and that starts with what we said in the conclusion of our brief uh, on page 18. All the district court has done is ensure adversarial briefing and an opportunity to ask questions about a pending motion. That's all the court has planned to do. That's all the court plans to do. And the briefing, when this whole process started, the briefing wasn't completed. It's still not completed. The government is going to have a chance, as well as Mr. Flynn, to file sir replies and lay out all of these issues, if appropriate. So there's no, there's no basis in the pleadings for en banc to suggest that the court has specific questions it's going to answer. I think counsel referred to footnote three, which is really talking about what the law says. It doesn't say, of course, that these are the questions that Judge Sullivan plans to answer. And in our initial um, briefing, we pointed out that when the government signed uh, the motion to dismiss, it was only the acting U.S. attorney. There were no declarations. There were no affidavits. We did not say that, therefore, there needs to be some and there's going to be any requirement. Again, the parties are speculating, and I think even said this might turn in, they suspect it will become a circus. There's absolutely no basis for that. There's nothing in anything that the court has done below or has done in its pleadings to suggest it will do anything that follow, then follow the law and listen to the arguments of the parties, ask any follow-up questions, and rule on the motion to dismiss. Is there, I mean, the uh, opposing counsel suggests, both opposing counsel suggests, there's a contemplation that you intend to get underlying documents about other charging decisions, why the government did or did not make other charging decisions. Maybe you'll call in the attorney general and ask, what's the real reason that you did this? Are these things contemplated or not? They are not contemplated, Your Honor. I believe that the reason the parties are suggesting that is because Judge Gleason, excuse me, Mr. Gleason, in his pleading suggested there might be a basis for that, but when he filed his pleading, he said he's not requesting any fact-finding. So Judge Sullivan surely has not entertained any of those issues, and even Mr. Gleason in his pleading has said that won't be required. So there's nowhere, again, anywhere in the record that suggests that that would be anything that Judge Sullivan intends to do at a hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Griffith. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Wilkinson. Are, are you then telling us that such questions won't be asked at the hearing? 
You, you said you <laughs> don't want to forecast the hearing. Maybe, maybe you should forecast the hearing a little bit. <laughs> and, and, are, and are you telling us that, that those lines of inquiry will not be pursued? Judge Griffith, I can't tell you exactly what won't be pursued, again, because the briefing is not completed and Judge Sullivan hasn't decided all of the questions he may or may not ask. And even during the oral argument, that could address a question that he has, and there may be no questions. I'll give you one example. When uh, the issue was raised about the acting U.S. attorney signing the pleading by itself, the government answered in one of its pleadings saying, well, that was signed off by the entire Department of Justice. That answers that question. The court may disagree, other people may disagree, but there's no need to pursue that because the government's answered that, that explained that and answered that question. So I see no basis if all of these pleadings are available to the court, the other um, filings are made. There's no reason to believe the court won't ask anything but what's narrowly prescribed in this hearing, which is listening to the arguments and asking any follow-up questions to those arguments. Do you have a view on uh, the scope of uh, Rule 48A, what is meant by uh, leave of court? We, we've had a, some discussion today about whether it's limited uh, to protecting uh, defendants from uh, vexatious uh, prosecution um, and uh, other views that uh, it, it is designed to allow, one of its purposes is to allow a district court judge um, to probe a dismissal that uh, he or she suspects might involve some uh, favoritism. Do, do you have a view on that matter? Well, I start like you did with the history of the rule, which is quite clear there was much debate about this, and most of it was focused not on protecting the defendant from harassment. I think that was already accepted, but it was on uh, protecting the public interest when there might be favoritism. Um, rewarding or dismissing a prosecution. And as the courts have gone along and developed the law here, there's been very little, but where they have, everyone has said the primary reason or the substantial major reason for the rule is because of protecting the defendant. But no one has said what I think we heard today, that that's the only purpose of a Rule 48A motion when the two parties agree. So I think the courts have left that open, Amy down commented on that and suggested what, what, that. What, what, what would happen if um, we're at a late stage of this prosecution, obviously, but what would happen if, if this had taken place in an earlier stage of the prosecution before sentencing and so forth? Um, uh, and and, and, and uh, Rule 48A. I'm sorry, stage. there's been an internal and error. You will be disconnected now. Goodbye. Hello? 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 Hey, what's up? I think I've been cut off. I think I was too. Yeah. Judges, I can, the conference seems to be up and running. Okay. Let Let's me get back in. Ann, are we still in yes, conference please, and no. things, things are proceeding? Okay. Judge Griffith, um, please. We have uh, just, I can't sorry, hear. We, have, we have just, well, Ms. Wilkinson, she just dropped. We're going to try to reconnect right now. Okay. Thank you, Ann.
Judge, he's, he's working so he's back on the line. Okay. Judge Griffith, I'm so sorry. I don't know how no, that, I got disconnected. I apologize. No, that's I'm not certain it's your fault at all. Uh, my, my, my question was if, if we were earlier in a uh, proceeding and um, uh, uh, a judge denied a motion to dismiss, what would, what would happen then? Are we assuming, Your Honor, that uh, it's the same basis that they thought they were going to pursue charges and decided they couldn't because or shouldn't? Yes. Uh, yes. I, I'm just I'm just wondering how um, it, it, wouldn't it be inappropriate for the uh, judicial branch to compel the executive branch to proceed with prosecution? Yes, it would be much more difficult. Obviously, you can't compel them to bring the prosecution. I think you could um, inquire about the reasons because you still may have a public interest in the integrity of the court, but it isn't the, the standard for 48 A is the same, but the totality of the circumstances one would consider are different because you now in the post plea phase have involved the court and as other judges have referred to, you're bringing the power of the court, the integrity of the court, and okay. the... Could, could, could you respond to the uh, criticism of Judge Sullivan for appointing Judge Gleason in light of the fact that uh, right before the appointment he had uh, staked out a public position uh, on the matter? How do you respond to that criticism? In appointing any amicus, the court is looking for the opposite viewpoint from what the two parties agree on yeah, and looking for full adversarial briefing. So the fact that Mr. Gleason announced that he had a position that was adverse to the government and to the defendant makes sense that he would be one of the candidates because he is being appointed not to be neutral, but to flesh out those legal arguments on the other side of the case. So one wouldn't, uh, you know, the best analogy I know is uh, Professor Paul Cassell, who's quite famous and has, you know, pursued Miranda issues for almost his entire career, asked the Supreme Court to be the amicus and argued against the government and the court listened and ruled against Mr. Cassell's position and no one thought it was inappropriate for him, even though it was publicly known uh, that his positions were adverse to the government. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Here's what may have lost Judge Millett. Momentarily, Judge Pillard. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Judge Pillard. Thank you. Um, so on the mandamus standard, we could decide that if we were to rule um, against the petition, we could decide that there were alternative remedies or that there was no clear and indisputable right. And I wonder if you have a view on which is the narrower ground. If Is there an alternative remedy? If so, what is it? Um, or do you think the narrower ground is to say that there's no clear and indisputable right at this point to bring about the proceeding? It's a real contest, but I believe the narrower ground is the alternative relief below because the judge has not yet ruled. So the easiest remedy would be for the judge to grant the motion to dismiss and there would be nothing even for a reviewing court to do. So that seems to me to be the narrowest and the most commonsensical uh, basis to deny the petition because the court has not made its decision yet. And so there the alternative remedy, just to be clear, is if the judge grants the rule, 48A motion is the district judge gave the government what it wanted and, and uh, General Flynn what he wanted. What if the judge were to deny the motion or postpone the motion? Is there an alternative remedy? I'm not sure postponing changes that, but once the decision is made, if somehow he denied the motion, then the parties could appeal. Right away. I mean, I thought we said in spoke or anyway, there wasn't an interlocutory appeal um, from a denial of a deferred prosecution agreement. Would there be an interlocutory appeal or would you say they would mandamus then or would it have to wait for after sentencing? I mean, I realize these are hypothetical issues because they're not before us, but I'm just trying to get a sense of what you're envisioning in terms of 
alternative remedies. And let me just lay it out. It, it seems to me that the, that really the flip side of or or wedded to the point about whether there's an alternative remedy is what is the right that's being remedied. And so in order to think that once the 48A is denied or at least postponed, that there would be some appeal, then one has to think that there's a right against that postponement. Do you see what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that unless we envision an outright denial, which seems at least statistically to be a very likely course, what the alternative remedy would be and whether one can decide that without deciding it and what the right is. I'm sure you'll let me know if I'm not addressing your question, but if the first point is the postponement, I, mean, I believe this court in In Re Aiken at least gave the participants there was an agency multiple chances to act. And when they ordered mandamus or, or ordered the writ, the agency had said specifically they were refusing to act and therefore that was considered by the court an action. Here, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know that a, you know, delay of some sort uh, would be warranted, a mandamus would be warranted for that. I mean, this matter could have been over on July 16th, ironically, if uh, the judge had been able to have his hearing. But assume you go forward with the hearing, they could appeal, there could be sentencing, that could all happen very quickly, and there could be a direct appeal. If the parties think that a mandamus is appropriate, at least there is an order from the court. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they would then be able to remedy that because the remedy would be, they would be asking for, would be to reverse his his decision, which is when you look at the law of mandamus in this circuit, that's 99% of the cases are, there's a decision by the court that mm -hmm. the parties disagree with. And then this court comes in and says, either that decision was appropriate or it should be reversed. Right, and if the judge didn't were to deny the Rule 48A or postpone it in some further, or let's say, just to make it complicated, given today's argument, if the judge were to say, I want an in-depth actual uh, hearing, not just an argument by lawyers, but in-depth hearing with new fact finding, that would be a different, that would be an open question whether there's a clear and indisputable right against that that could be remedied. Um, somehow or whether that, that I'm sorry, I'm garbling. Um, that would present a separate mandamus question. Yes, because you have the two prongs, not just um, the alternative relief, but the clear and indisputable. Right. Thank right. You. And so I, both so, have to so here, the reason that you say the alternative remedy is, is the narrowest is because the clear and indisputable right that is missing is the right to the relief before the judge rules. Yes. And you just don't have to go further than that. You don't have to inquire whether there's fact finding, how broad the judge's authority is to deny a Rule 48 8A motion or anything else. You just have to say that the judge gets to rule and as long as it's a simple argument. And we're Pre having... Yes, premised upon the understanding the judge will follow the law. And there's no reason to believe but, that this judge who has over 25 years of experience on the district court would do anything but follow the law. Right, thank you. It's helpful. Thank, thank you. Questions. Thank you. Go back to Judge, I'm sorry. We'll go back to Judge Millett. Um, yes, sorry, uh, good afternoon. I apologize, I've been off for about five minutes. So if I ask you something that someone else has already asked, you have full liberty just to say, we already discussed that and I will read the transcript. Um, so I think Judge Pillard was talking about this, but again, I missed the beginning. Um, if this district order, had said, if the district court's order said, and on uh, July 16th, there will be an evidentiary hearing to address the grounds for the government's position, or the government's filing, is your position that that could not be mandamus? I don't think it would be mandamus because I don't think it's clear and indisputable that that's inappropriate and that's um, forbidden by the law. If you look at Fokker uh, or you look at Sena, which is Judge Sullivan's own case where, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Where looking at and, and asking questions of the government was never held by the court to be inappropriate. It was the well, actual the decision. Asking questions of the government. This is, will be an evidentiary hearing um, to examine 
the real grounds for the government's decision. Um, I think a fair inference from that is that somebody from the government is going to be having to put in evidence on the basis for their decision making. You think a district court can do that? And the government still has to go through the whole hearing and wait for the district court to rule before it can file mandamus? It depends on what we mean by an evidentiary hearing when you're still talking about the government. I'm telling you, that's all we know from the order. <laughs> an evidentiary hearing to examine the genuine grounds for the government's decision. I think the government should attend the hearing, and if there's anything inappropriate, if that's all we know, if there's anything inappropriate about the hearing, they shouldn't. They should refuse to present witnesses if that's what they're being asked for. If they're uh, supposed to put evidence that they think somehow impinges upon their Article II uh, power. Well, that's what Cheney said they don't have to do. Well, I don't think. Well, I don't think that is what Cheney told them they don't have to do. Cheney said, if you think it is surely part of the executive privilege and you object and shouldn't have to even make those distinctions, then you should claim that privilege and that's it and the court then should stop. And the court did not stop. The court still ordered discovery. Here, the government never took that position. The government never said, we absolutely don't have to answer any questions. We don't have to make any explanation. In fact, they chose to make a 17-page explanation. They chose to respond uh, to the amicus brief, and they haven't made any of those arguments below. That's why, uh, technically, I'm not sure I, I understand why it may not matter to some people technically that they didn't file a petition for mandamus, but it is indicative of what their position was at the time, whether this was such protected Article II power that was being usurped by the court. They didn't say that to the court at the time. Can I, can I, I'm sorry, just some in the interest of time here. Um, uh, in this case, all that's going to be held, all, all that we know from July, on July 16 is a hearing. And who knows how long after that it would take a district court to rule. Let's imagine it's a different case where um, uh, at the same procedural stage after a plea pre-sentencing, the government comes up and says, there's a filing that says, uh-oh, we have to dismiss because we DNA evidence just came in, but um, uh, it was, and it, and it completely exonerates. The defendant, this needs to be dismissed. And this defendant is incarcerated at the time, um, pre-trial, or I'm sorry, pending sentencing, post plea pending sentencing. Defendant's incarcerated, DNA, complete exoneration, according to the government. Can the district court take six, seven weeks to have a hearing and then a month to issue a decision, keeping a defendant under the custody of the United States when the United States says, we're done? We don't want to have this in person in custody. We don't want to prosecute them. Yes, Your Honor, that happens all the time at the district court. I mean, that happens when, when the, the government, government comes in. We don't want to prosecute them. We'll, we'll let the you know let them go. We're done. We're not prosecuting. And the government has said, in my hypothetical, the person's innocent. Your Honor, with DNA evidence like that, there are examples where the district court has a hearing. Now, the exact weeks, obviously, most courts would like to schedule that. As soon as possible, they may ask for briefings, yes. but that it, the court doesn't, doesn't release seem, the. But doesn't it seem like if you have someone, I, I understand that Mr. Flynn is not incarcerated, but he's still under custodial restrictions. Um, and if, 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 a, if someone, the government says someone should be at liberty, we should not be prosecuting them. Don't you think the district court should go as fast as possible if it's going to have? even just briefing and an argument in this circumstance as a matter of the liberty interest of defendants? I can't imagine keeping someone incarcerated for a few more months when the government says they're totally exonerated. We don't want to prosecute them. Well, the of course, court everyone... Fast, shouldn't they? The court should go as fast as possible, and here there's no suggestion that there was any is delay. This fast as po is this as fast as possible? Seven weeks? Just to the hearing? Not even a decision? Yes, to order the briefing. District courts go much, much faster, even with amicus briefings. We see it all the time. Why shouldn't and courts go much, much longer, Your Honor, in district courts. I understand, they, but that's what, I'm saying. that's what I'm asking. They may do it. I'm not, it may not be right. I'm asking whether it's right. Well, I don't think the custodial restrictions here are any in any way compar <laughs> comparative to incarceration. The examples are he's Mr. Flynn had some— Under our Constitution, had, he's not under liberty. 
I understand he's on, you know, been released on his recognizance, and the district court has been very um, understanding of him, but he's still not at liberty. And and the principle here of the district court's right to hold hearings and take you know take its time and examining things, getting around to decide, it's going to apply in, in, in every case. But that's never been a basis for irreparable harm, Your Honor. There's no case that says that when a, a, a uh, 48A motion is pending and a defendant is under ROR and has been allowed to travel overseas even by the court, no, no, but, but somehow that's an irreparable harm. My, so what my, my, my hypothetical is someone who's incarcerated. Completed this incarcerated court has had that. Assessment. This court has had that in al-Nashiri, and that defendants were were detained, they were incarcerated, and there were separation of powers issues raised. And this Did court the government still said there they are completely their innocence. The evidence has exonerated them. We no longer wish to prosecute them. That's no, my concern. No. Yes. There's all kinds no. of other times. Yes. Other issues that come up in criminal prosecutions. I'm talking about this circumstance. Well, there's no clear and indisputable rule that the court has to rule within a week or within 10 days, and it may depend on the particular facts, but here, Mr. Flynn has as much freedom as any defendant in the United States does when they've pled guilty to a crime, and the government now comes and says they no longer want to prosecute. There's briefing and a hearing. That's it. All right. Um, my time is up. Thank you. Judge Wilkins? Yes. Good morning, Ms. Wilkinson. Good morning, um, Your Honor. What is your position as to the range of public interest factors that a district judge can properly consider uh, in whether to grant or deny a motion under Rule 48A? I'll answer your question, Your Honor, but it's easier to say what they're not. Of course, the court cannot second-guess the prosecutorial decision uh, made by the government. So the public interest factors have not been fully explored by courts, but they have given examples of misconduct by the prosecutor like bribery or even failure to appear at the hearing. And other courts have talked about the integrity of the judicial branch and the public interest in the integrity of the system. So it would be fact-specific but it certainly doesn't include second-guessing the prosecutorial decisions. All right. Uh, thank you. I don't have any further questions. Thank you, Jess Rao. Um, thank you, um, Ms. Wilkinson. Um, maybe you can help me to understand what precisely the district judge's interest is in pursuing uh, rehearing at this stage. So we have a situation where the executive branch wishes to drop the prosecution um, because it has confessed a number of errors in the process. And so we have the interest of the executive branch in controlling prosecutions, which I think you admit is a well-established part of the Article II power. Um, and then, you know, so the separation of powers between the executive and the courts in this case relates also not just in some abstract way to individual liberty, but really directly to the liberty interests of an individual criminal defendant, namely General Flynn. Um, so, so where we have here an unopposed motion to dismiss, what interest does the district judge have um, in continuing to scrutinize the dismissal of a prosecution? What, what is the district judge seeking to vindicate on rehearing and um, with the inquiries that you know, have been represented will be made um, below? The rehearing, Your Honor, is meant to protect the process which, and the mandamus standard because under the panel's decision, although um, written to be fact-specific, could open the floodgates to other people who are unhappy with a, a district court not ruling on a motion, thinking that they know what the answer should be, that the answer is clear from the case law or the precedent, and moving to mandamus a district court whenever they think they're in that position. So it's broader than just this particular Rule 48A issue. But so a district judge has a right to litigate on behalf of legal standards generally? Does that make him a party to this case? Does it make him a freewheeling advocate? I mean, what is precisely 
is the judge's interest in this any more than there would be in any case where the panel issues an opinion where a district judge may disagree with the Court of Appeals legal analysis. He doesn't have a right to litigate or is not a party, Your Honor. This court made him a respondent. What that means for purpose of mandamus, I don't think is totally clear, but the court ordered him to respond and participate in the process. He didn't volunteer to participate. That process played out at the panel level. So what is the interest in seeking rehearing by a district judge? I mean, what is, I mean, he's not deciding, I mean, judges have an Article III power to decide cases and controversies. Well, there's no, what exactly is the district judge doing in this context? I mean, I think it's not surprising that it's so unusual that there are virtually no cases in which a district judge has appeared in this posture. I think the government found only one case and rehearing was denied. So what exactly is being vindicated here? I mean, maybe you can help me understand that. Well, first, there are cases, Your Honor, where district courts have moved for cert at the Supreme Court and review there and either been granted or denied. And the court, the parties, I mean, the judge has not been seen as a participant nor, you know, reassigned when the case went back to the district court. But there's not a vindication of any right. The panel made its decision with three able judges. And now the respondent is asking for all 10 judges in this court to reconsider and to review and make its decision again on what the law should be in this circuit. It's the same posture he was in with in front of three judges. Most respectfully, we're just now arguing in front of 10 judges and you all will make that decision. But he doesn't have a interest. He is. We made a suggestion, like I said, consistent with Western Pacific, which has been clear for 70 years that that doesn't mean that the judge or anyone else is a litigant or a party. It's that if you can make a suggestion to the court for something they can do themselves, which you can do yourselves and in essence did by voting to accept this petition, then all he's interested in is that the 10 of you decide whether mandamus is appropriate or not. So can district judges in other cases, not mandamus cases, simply file briefs suggesting that we reconsider cases on bond where we disagree with with the district court ruling below? In cases where the circuit has not made them a respondent, I doubt that would be appropriate. But this is a very unique situation where the court was ordered to defend its judgment below, which was a process, not a decision. It was ordered to say, explain why it was doing what it was doing. OK, one of the things we haven't talked about that much is the presumption of regularity here. And so, you know, the government here has submitted a fairly significant amount of information about the irregular behavior and its reasons for wanting to dismiss this prosecution. So I guess I'm wondering, you know, how does the government's motion here not meet the standards for regularity? Because it seems that there has to be some overcoming of the presumption of regularity for the district judge to to continue on the path that has been contemplated. I don't think that's correct, Your Honor. The path contemplated is just a hearing with argument from lawyers. And the presumption of regularity applies. And in the absence of clear evidence to the contrary, the courts presume that the prosecutors have properly discharged their official duties. That's from Falker. That doesn't say that it can't be tested whether there was a presumption of regularity, because if so, then there would be a rule of regularity, not a presumption of regularity. It may be that, again, when the briefing is completed, there's no real question about that. And the court doesn't even ask about that. The hearing is completed and the decision is issued. So there's not a path that's suggesting that the court is somehow saying it can and will overcome the presumption of regularity. I think what you're now classifying is just a hearing. And that's what you repeatedly said here at oral argument doesn't really match up with what was filed in the brief before this court, both at the panel level and on the hearing. And it seems like there is some much greater scrutiny that is contemplated that goes well beyond, you know, just a hearing to to evaluate to evaluate the motion to dismiss. Well, Your Honor, if I 
or if we suggested in our pleadings specifically what the questions would be, then that's my error. There is no basis to believe that there's any specific even questions that are contemplated yet. And I think in, in your panel decision, you said the questions would likely reveal internal deliberative process and other executive branch discussions. It's not clear that that's true, but again, if that happens, or if it had happened based on the briefing, the government can make that point to the court and the court could say, okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to pursue those questions any further. And you also said that the questioning could threaten to chill law enforcement by subjecting the prosecutor's motives and decision-making to outside inquiry. And I understand that. So far, the government hasn't taken that position when actually confronted with the issues, when they responded to Mr. Gleason's brief. But again, if the government believes that questions by the court somehow invade or usurp their power, that's all they need to say. And it shouldn't be presumed that the court will overrule that or make a record and say, I'm going to rule against you. The court may be persuaded that the government has every right to give that answer and move on. Let me just ask you one final question. Um, yeah, it's my, over my time. But um, so if, you know, if we were to, to not provide the relief here, I mean, would we be setting out a rule that we, that this court can never issue a writ of mandamus absent a district court's ruling on a dispositive motion. Is that the rule that would have to come out of this? No. I mean, is that the rule that you're advocating? Because that rule seems to me inconsistent with Cheney and Cobell and the Field case. No, I don't think that's the rule. And I don't think, I think In Ray Rakin makes that clear. There can be lack of action that's tantamount to an action. So I don't think, however this court fashioned uh, its decision, it would have to say that in no circumstances can there be mandamus uh, when there's a hearing scheduled. Uh, well, I, if it says that there was an adequate means because, you know, the government could always appeal, um, isn't that suggesting that that's, you know, a categorical rule? Well, again, there's a presumption that the district court will do its job and follow the law. So, yes, I think generally there would be little or no basis for mandamus for a district court judge who's scheduling a hearing. But as Judge Srinivasan asked me, could there be something that happened uh, even in the order for that hearing that suggested totally improper conduct outside the clear, you know, law of the circuit? There could be. And, of course, that could be a basis for mandamus. But the presumption here in front of this court is that district courts do their job and follow the law. Thank you. Thank you. Judge Henderson, any follow-up question? I do have one question, and that is uh, <clears throat> the trial judge was ordered not to defend any action by the three-judge panel. He was directed to file a response addressing the motion to dismiss. And that was at our invitation. Rule 21 makes clear there's a very limited role for the trial judge in a mandamus proceeding. I'd like to know why Rule 35 suddenly allows him, without any invitation from us, um, to petition for rehearing in bank. I don't think it is Rule 35, Your Honor. My understanding in, in reading Western Pacific is that then Were you on bonk. Excuse me. That was the procedure your petition followed was Rule 35. You invoked Rule 35. Yes, Your Honor, but I think it depends on how you interpret the word party. I don't think he's a party for the, the having a vested interest in the outcome. As you said, the way you required him to respond was, I don't think, trying to make him a party. But in terms of interpreting that term and that process in light of Western Pacific, the whole purpose of the rule was to allow anyone who's involved to make that request. It's this court's decision and you have your own authority to do so. It's a power of the court. It's not a power of the litigant or the participant. And I, I think you may be asking me, you know, does that make him look like he has a vested interest or an inappropriate interest in the outcome? And I do not think that's true because it's, it's we're making the exact I agree. I agree with you, Ms. Wilkinson. He's not a party. I agree with you. 
but you're the one who invoked a rule limited to a party. So that's that's all I want to know. And I, you've answered my question, so I'm done. Thank you. Judge Rogers? I wonder if you want briefly to um, address the reassignment issue and the invocation of Section 455. Thank you, Judge Rogers. As the panel found, there was no basis to reassign this case um, from Judge Sullivan. And therefore, the only change since that panel decision was the filing of the request for en banc and the, the pleadings themselves, which talk about the law. So explaining your views on the law for the district court again in the same proceeding, the same mandamus proceeding that you were in before, does not seem to show any basis of bias or appearance of impropriety. It's the same process. It's the same proceeding. It's not the same as the underlying criminal proceeding, but it's the same mandamus proceeding with the judge making the same arguments he did to the original a panel of three. And so there's, there's no reason to uh, reassign the case to another judge. He will follow whatever this panel said or whatever this full court says he should do. Well, you heard um, the acting solicitor general argue that even were the in-bank court uh, to deny the petition, it should uh, include in its opinions instructions to the district court. I gather from your argument that you take it that A, some aspects of the record have not been fully um, appreciated, and, and secondly, uh, that the concerns expressed are largely um, hypothetical or speculative, um, other than the delay that's involved as a result of the seeking of mandamus. Um, the process was proceeding, uh, whether as fast as possible, I'm not going to get into, but I'm, I'm trying to understand the acting solicitor general's position is, is very strong in terms of his emphasis on not only the Cheney concerns, but on the process contemplated by the district court. Um, if, if you care to respond to that, some of it in your earlier answers, I realize, have said that it appears to be some over-reading of what's contemplated were this to go forward before the district court. Is it your view then that uh, even if the court does not need to instruct the district court to follow the law as we see it, that no further uh, instruction is required? In other words, there's been a question from the beginning about what does leave of court mean? And is it simply a courtesy? Um, the prosecutor has decided it has no case or it does not want to proceed with the case. And that's the end of the matter. And we're just here to let you know, Judge, that's where we are. Um, then there are the other hypotheticals that have been posed this morning, which go beyond anything I'm aware of in the record here. So that's a lot of issues in one uh, statement, but I'm just curious about what instructions you think would be appropriate, if any, and why the concerns expressed by the acting solicitor general and General Flynn's attorney uh, should not be of concern to the court or that the court need not address them were it to deny um, the petition for mandamus. Judge Rogers, I'll answer. I think those are two questions, and I'll start with the first one of whether any instructions are necessary for the district court. They are not, but I think in part that's because there's been uh, expansive briefing in this case, underlying, which has not finished, as you point out, in the district court. but quite a bit here that has been instructive about the scope of Rule 48A and leave of court. So I don't see any need for 
um, instructions from this court on what that means. And I certainly don't see any reason to think that there's going to be this invasive questioning. There is nothing in the record, as I stated earlier, to suggest any question that Judge Sullivan intends to ask, but certainly there's been no request for evidence. There's been no request for declarations or affidavits or witnesses or any of the things that were uh, kind of weaved into some of the parties' pleadings to suggest that the, gov that the judge was somehow going to go beyond a narrow scope of a, a, a legal hearing on a motion to dismiss. So speculating about hypothetical questions that could answer be be asked certainly is a basis for mandamus, but there's also a cure below if for some reason that occurred where the government doesn't have to answer those questions and can explain to the court why it's inappropriate. So for all those reasons, I don't think any instructions are necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Judge Tatel? I, I have no questions. Thank you. Judge Garland? I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Griffith. Yeah, uh, just to follow up on that, uh, Ms. Wilkinson, what, what would be permissible questioning under Rule 48A and Article 2? Generally, Your Honor, especially with regard to this case, I think it would be following up on the briefing uh, that the parties have submitted. And because there's still sir replies to come and there's argument, I, I can't say that there might be a lot of questioning. It depends on how the government and the parties address those issues. If you just start with where we were a couple weeks ago before Mr. Gleason filed his brief, there was speculation, oh, there's going to be a request for evidence and fact finding. And then when we waited or, or you know, we came to the point where Mr. Gleason filed his brief, he said he's not requesting any fact finding. So I think it's, uh, I think the general scope would be narrow but it may be even uh, an even thinner read um, or, or an, uh, a smaller list of questions when all of the briefing is finished. And that's just but, hard but to you, predict. But you, but you agree, are you saying fact finding would be categorically inappropriate? No, but I don't, without, without some basis for it, yes. I can't predict that there won't be any basis. It's certainly, we haven't seen that thus far, but you know, again, I can't tell you what's going to happen, what the government is going to say, or Mr. Flynn's going to say in a sir reply, but it doesn't seem like there's any basis for that right now. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Judge Millett? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, two questions. Um, I think you said in your brief that these uh, separation of powers concerns on behalf of the government shouldn't be considered because they didn't file a mandamus petition, but I don't understand why they can't be raised by a criminal defendant in a case because to the extent, you know, a district court is uh, charged with or the, or the concern is that the district court is violating the separation of powers by intruding on the prosecutorial judgment, it's the criminal defendant's ox is being gored. You know, my hypothetical, it would be uh, the guy who's been exonerated by DNA continuing to sit in a prison cell for weeks if not months, and separation of powers protects the liberty of individuals. So I don't understand why it matters that the, whether the government did or did not file a mandamus petition in this case for purposes of the separation of powers argument. I think that raises two points, Your Honor. First, uh, the incarcerated defendant in your hypothetical could claim he's suffering irreparable harm himself and not have to rely on the government's irreparable harm or basis for irreparable harm. But I think Bond does give an argument to say that uh, another party can raise the government's, uh, you know, irreparable harms. The difference here is whether that's true or right, not. They're not raising the government. Right? They're, great. they're saying, look, the Constitution divides power to protect individual liberty, including mine. And if the district court is, in a you know, hypothetical case, blowing past those lines and it has consequences on that defendant in that case, and the defendant gets to argue about it. It's not that they're making the government's argument, it's that they're making a liberty argument about separation of powers. I don't understand, I didn't understand, and maybe I'm incorrect, that that was Mr. Flynn's position, that his liberty was a separation of powers or constitutional argument. He was saying it was irreparable harm under Rule 48 and under mandamus. 
but I don't, I didn't understand that. Well, his his if custody, his status as a criminal defendant has been prolonged. He's not as free as you and I are to come and go. Well, he's pretty darn close. He's been able to do everything he wants to do we can with permission of his... You know what? If, 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 I'm, if I have governmental constraints on my liberty for one day, that makes me different. That's true. And in terms of the length of this process, Mr. Flynn could have gone down and asked for reconsideration, could have asked for expediting the briefing, expediting the hearing. Parties do that all the time at the district court. No one did that here. No one made the argument you're making that this is not happening quickly enough and I would like the process to go more quickly. Mr. Flynn now says through counsel that it's been dragging on forever, but he had a basis to go back to the court and say, I want this decided more quickly. And that would have been the easiest way to speed up the time frame if he thought it was inappropriate, but he didn't do that. He didn't choose to do that despite the court's specific request or, or willingness to accept a motion to reconsider everything that he had done when he um, when he issued his order uh, around May 20th. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm afraid my time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Pillard. I have no questions. Thank you, Judge Wilkins. No questions. Thank you, Judge Rao. Uh, no further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilkinson. We'll now hear we'll now hear rebuttal from Ms. Powell and General Wall. In light of the lateness of the hour, let's hear two minutes of rebuttal, but that time will be uninterrupted. Ms. Powell. You're, thank you, Your Honor. Back. Thank you. This is a criminal case in which a man's liberty and entire life has been consumed by four years of litigation that the executive has now determined within its sole discretion should never have been brought against him. He has been under the scourge and of this criminal process now for almost four years. Mr. Gleason has no valid role here whatsoever. It's the process itself at, since May 7th that has been part of the abuse that General Flynn has suffered. These are completely unprecedented proceedings, and the reason they are is because they should never have happened. Mandamus doesn't need to have an order to seek review of it. Its very purpose in existence is to correct a usurpation of power or the district judge exceeding his authority, which he did the very minute he appointed Mr. Gleason to step into this case in the role of a prosecutor, essentially, when the executive branch, in its sole discretion, decided this case should never have been brought to begin with. So he's been through this for almost four years now, cost him millions of dollars, had to sell his house because of it, been called a traitor and treasonous for absolutely no reason, and not any of this should have happened. So it is imperative that this court restore the rule of law and issue the writ of mandamus to compel the judge to grant the motion to dismiss and to disqualify Judge Sullivan because the very thought, the very fact that he thinks he has an interest that he can petition for rehearing to this court on is sufficient evidence of appearance of bias that mandates his disqualification under this court's decision in al-Nashiri. The appointment of the amicus has to be vacated and the order must be dismissed immediately as a matter of law on the face of the motion itself. To borrow from the Second Circuit decision in HSBC, put simply, the court's role is not as a super prosecutor to second guess a core function of the executive branch, but as a neutral arbiter of law. He's lost that neutrality, if, if not sooner than at least by the time he filed a petition for rehearing for, in which he has no standing and which has required additional thousand hours of defense work to deal with. Thank you, so we Ms. Powell. Please, please finish. Uh, I was just going to say we ask that the petition for rehearing be flatly denied with clear ligand-like language and the order of dismissal entered in Stanter or by this court itself as it has the authority to do. Thank you, Ms. Powell. General Wall. Thank you, Your Honor. To be honest, I feel a bit rope -a 
the district court appointed an amicus who had urged an intensely factual inquiry. In its panel briefs, the district judge raised a host of specific factual questions and noted the government had not put in affidavits and declarations. Even the rehearing petition calls for a developed factual record. Before the panel, counsel backed away from factual development. Today, counsel steps back even further and suggests there's not much the court can ask and we can decline to answer. Counsel seems to be defending the process on the ground that it might be meaningless. I think that tepid defense gives away the game. Either the process is exactly what we have all understandably feared, in which case mandamus is warranted, or the process could not possibly call into question the reasons on the face of the motion to dismiss, in which case mandamus is warranted. In the event this court disagrees, yes, we think it should provide clear guidance for further proceedings in three ways. First, it should reiterate that the Constitution and Fokker leave a very limited role for the district court, which does not mean an independent, non-deferential public interest analysis. Second, we think the court should, as the panel dissent did, make clear that the parties are not required to engage in discovery or put on evidence. Third, and finally, the court should require a quick decision so that the defendant and government may, if necessary, return to this court for relief. But to be clear, none of this should be necessary. When Fokker says that dismissing charges is an executive decision and that there is no substantial role for courts, it's impossible to square that with an invitation to the public to participate, the appointment of a hostile amicus to oppose the government's motion, a full, full brief schedule and hearing, all backed by the threat of contempt, and all in the face of a judgment by the Attorney General of the United States that a prosecution here is no longer in the interest of justice. Yes, this is an extraordinary writ, but the district court has teed up an extraordinary conflict with the separation of powers. The United States respectfully submits that the writ should issue. Thank you. Thank you, General Wall. And thank you to all counsel for your arguments this morning and this afternoon. We will take the case under submission. This honorable court is now adjourned until Wednesday, September 9th at 9.30 a.m. All participants are now in interim. Vice President.